You know, this is the age of the app, isn't it? Just think about it. Just about anything you can think of, you can find an app for. Uh, and we find them, uh, you can put them on your phones, uh, your computers. Uh, if you want to order food, pizza, there's an app for that. If you want to uh, track your exercise and lose weight, there's an app for that. Uh, if you want to uh, be able to, uh, to know the, uh, the weather, there's an app for that. So just about anything that you think of today, there, there's an app for it. Uh, and so you, you go on and, and you, you know, like on my phone, uh, you, you'll go on and you, you'll see, uh, you go on the app store and you'll download the app. Most of them, a lot of them are free. And then you're all set, right? You got your app. Well, not exactly. Uh, before you get the app, uh, you, you'll notice a little checkbox. And right beside of the checkbox, it says, I agree to the terms and conditions and the use of, for the use of this product. Terms and conditions, the T and C of the product. And so before you can get the app, you have to accept the terms and conditions. Now, some of you might scroll down and, and look at some of that, but for most of these, uh, there's over, uh, you know, 2,500 words. And so it would take a person, if you were re a fast reader, uh, you know, at least 10 minutes or more to read each and every one, uh, you know, if you were reading those, even if you read, uh, you know, 250 words a minute. It'd take you a while to get through that. So how many people actually do that? Uh, maybe a couple of the lawyers in here, I don't know, but most of the people, we don't take the time to read all those, do we? And, and in fact, with all the apps that we read and we download on our computers and our phones, those of us, not everybody is uh, into those things and, and not everybody is online, uh, but m most of the people in here are. And if, with all the apps that you do uh, throughout the year, it's estimated it would take 25 days of your time to read all the T and C, all the terms and conditions of those apps. Who does that? Not me, probably not anybody. Uh, but here's the thing, when we, say I sign that and we, I, I agree with the terms and conditions, we may be getting more than we bargain for sometimes. There may be some hidden things that we don't know about that we didn't want. Well, I wonder sometimes as a Christian if we are getting more than we bargain for. You would think that would be a good thing, right? But the truth of the matter is, there's some things in the Christian life that maybe they didn't tell you in the T and C that you signed up for, and you're like, oh yeah, I do that. And you got more than you bargained for. Trials, tribulations, and criticism. Anytime you step up to do something, somebody's always out there to tell you what you did wrong. And, and uh, I like what Mark said. He said when he was uh, doing the Habitat for Humanity and somebody complained and come in and said, we should be doing this and we should be doing that. He said, great, you're in charge. Let's go do that. So, so uh, maybe that's what we need to do uh, you in the church. Anytime somebody complains, we'll put them in charge or something. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes in the Christian life, uh, we get more than what we bargain for. And I think that maybe the disciples, maybe the church of Thessalonica was getting more what they thought. You know, Jesus comes on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he says to these fishermen out there, these young boys, follow me. Well, they've been looking for somebody to follow. They were sort of wanting some to follow, and they, they expected someone to come to lead them. And they said, sign me up. And right away, they, they said, I agree with the terms and conditions. But did they really know what they were getting into? Did they realize what they were giving up? Did they realize what would, they would be sacrificing, even their own lives, some of them?
And sometimes in the Christian life, we can make it look like an easy thing. And we, you know, we talk about, you know, come and follow Jesus and Jesus will make your life wonderful. And he does. But there are some T and C to the Christian life that we need to be honest about. That sometimes if we walk the way that we're supposed to walk and live the way that we're supposed to live, that there will be times where things won't always go the way that we want them to. And people won't always like us for it. And so you come to this church, the church of Thessalonica, and you've got some problems going on in this church. People were not doing their share. In fact, they weren't doing anything, really. And, and uh, I, I think we have some scriptures up here. I want to I wanna kind of go with this. If we got them, uh, William, if you just put up the scripture for me, the first one. There we go. You may not be able to see this, but now we command you in the name of Jesus that you keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition they received from us. There were people in the church at this time who were idle. And another word that can be used in this is lazy. It can be translated. They were just lazy. But they were also some people who were not doing things for a reason. And I'll tell you what that was in a minute. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with the toil and labor, we worked that night and day so that we might not burden any of you. And this was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. And so uh, what, is, what is going on here is in the, most scholars believe that in the church at this time, there was a great anticipation that the Lord was coming back really, really soon. And so some people had decided, what's the point of working? What's the point of fixing the roof when Jesus is going to come back? You know, his old song, this old house I'm living in is in need of repair. The windows and the shutters are letting in the cold, cold air. I say to myself, I'm going to fix it when I can get the time. But lately all I'm getting is leaving on my mind. Well, that's what was going on with this church. They had leaving on their mind. And the Apostle Paul had wrote in a way in, this, in the readings of First and Second Thessalonians of an anticipation of a coming of the Lord. But some of the fine print maybe they didn't read because Paul said there were some things that had to take place before all this came out. And it wasn't just going to be right then. And so they were expecting it to be right then. That they, there was no need to work because Jesus is coming back. We've seen that time after time. We've seen churches and cults and religions who have said, well, Jesus is coming back a certain time. People quit their jobs, sell their homes, whatever, and only to be disappointed. Perhaps that what, that's what was going on in the church. They were being idle, maybe because they were lazy, or maybe because they thought, what's the point? Jesus is coming back for me. And then, uh, if you can go to the next slide there, William. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. Well, we could use that today, couldn't we, in some of our, our places. Now, that's not talking about that we don't help those less fortunate. We do. That's part of what Jesus said. So let's not get mixed up on that. He says, you know, that we help the poor and we do all that. But there's people that could be helping that don't. Not only were they not helping, they were getting in the way of those that wanted to do work. And he said, for we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do the work quietly and to earn their own living. And here's why, because we should not be weary in doing what is right. Part of the problem I think that's going on here goes on in our churches today. We find people who don't have enough to do. And when you don't have enough to do, you get into trouble. Pretty soon you start complaining. You start seeing all the problems in the church. It don't have to look long. You always find problems. And you just become a complainer. 
And then you get two or three others with you, and you begin to complain with them. And, oh, you look, you know, let, uh, look what they're doing. They're, they're not doing things right. And the preacher, he's not doing things right. And, and before you know, you've got a group, and you've got a kind of a coup going on. And I think the Apostle Paul is saying, and I'll iterate, reiterate that same thing, is that we today need to be busy in God's, God's service. And that we, if we're busy doing what we're supposed to be doing, and we're busy doing what is right, we won't grow weary in well-doing because we're too busy to worry about what other people are doing or not doing. You see, if we don't have anything to do, if we got too much time on our hands, we'll find all kinds of things wrong. And we'll be upset, and we'll be mad, and we'll, you know, all kinds of things happen. But when, if you'll get busy serving God, and you'll, you'll just realize that, hey, I'm just going to do my part. I'm going to get involved. I'm going to do what, is, what needs to be done. Then all these places you see where there's cracks and there's problems, they kind of get taken care of because we're all doing it together. It's easy to stand back and say, boy, if I was a preacher, I would do it like this. Boy, yeah, I wouldn't do that, and I would do this. But when you're actually in the trenches doing the work yourself, it's not so easy. So when we get down and we get dirty and we get, and we get our hands dirty and we get in the, in the thick of things and begin to work in the kingdom of God, knowing that Jesus is coming back, but we don't know when, then all of a sudden we don't worry about those things that don't matter so much anymore. Because there are more important things to worry about in the body of Christ. We can always look around, of course, and find some things. But the truth of the matter is, each and every one of us, each and every one of us has things that we could change in our lives if we, if we would. And so let's not worry about what's wrong with the preacher or what's wrong with the Sunday school teacher or what's wrong with the choir or whatever. Let's say, you know what, it's not a perfect church. A lot of times, and I've said this before, people look for a church that will fill all their needs. First of all, you're probably not going to find it. But even if you do, I'm not sure that's the way we're supposed to do it. Because I think that, that we ought to be looking for a place where we can work and serve. I was talking to someone yesterday who said that they went to this church. And it wasn't the church that they would have picked if they had been looking for a church. But they saw a need in this church that they could feel. That nobody was feeling. And that was music. There was no musicians in that church. This little church. And so... They felt God leading them to go and do the music for that church. And so, you know, it goes back to the old question, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Same thing in the church. Where, where is there a need that I can feel? Where is there something in the Christian life that I can help with and I can do? I thank God. for this church, and I thank for the people, you know, that, you know, I know we don't thank you enough. When we think about what has been done in this church and the work that's been done to the buildings and the grounds and all the, the work has went into it. And think about the, a few years ago when I first came, uh, they, they just com were com had completed the basement work and done all these uh, new rooms and all these things that go on in the, ch the church. We've elevators. I mean, there's been a lot happen. And then there's other things that go on, the little ins and outs. And I think about what it takes to make a church go, and each and every person. And God gives us gifts that are important. Just think small things maybe to some people, but they're not so small when nobody's doing it. The backpack ministry, getting the food, making sure the food is here, somebody putting the food together. The sound and the equipment and uh, the money that, uh, you know, that we have to disperse and keep up with. The music, and I know I'm, I'm leaving something out, but the bulletins. I mean, all these things that are important that, you know, sometimes we may forget. And I'm thankful for people, you know, like Sarah, who will say, hey, you know, uh, what about this? This, this hasn't been done. And, and sometimes she'll uh, kind of 
remind me of some things, or she'll do it herself. And I'm thankful for people. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for you. But I want you to know that God has a job for each and every one of you sitting here today. I don't know what that is, but he wants us to be involved in the ministry of his work and in the local church. And whether you think it's big or not, if you're doing it for the least of these, remember what I told the children. Jesus said, you're doing it for me. A cup of cold water, whatever it is, it's done for the right reason. God will help you in that. We never know what one little thing that we do, how much a difference that will make in someone's life. We just never know. And I thank God for people in our church that, that will pray and, and will, uh, will go to God. And, you know, sometimes we need those people in our church, just prayer warriors, people that will, will just go to God and say, Lord, pray for these people. Pray for our pastor. Pray for our leaders. We need those kind of people in our church. And, and one of those, uh, I was telling Mark about, uh, was a young lady that had been praying for in our prayer breakfast that uh, had been on drugs and uh, was in the hospital. No one expected her to live, I'll be honest with you. No one, no one in the hospital that I knew. And she came off the vent. And uh, uh, Friday, uh, got the opportunity to go to her, and I asked her about becoming a Christian. And right there in that room, she began to cry. And she became a Christian that day, and I was able to baptize her. Yesterday, she got in a regular room. Now, prayers. I was, I was thanking Mark and everyone who prayed at that prayer breakfast for this young woman. I believe prayer works. And I think if that is the only gift that you have, thank God for that gift. Because it's a wonderful, wonderful gift. So what is it that the Lord would lead you to? And I guess part of this message is just to say thank you. We're getting ready to start a new year with new officers. And one of those officers we're going to be voting on tonight, uh, Melinda Lynch, is going to be uh, if the board approves, and I hope they will, uh, that she will be the new treasurer for our church. What an honor to step into the shoes that her mother uh, was, was the former treasurer and be able to fulfill that role. And so as these new officers stand up, and I think about these young men, Bruce and William, that are now doing, involved in things in the church, and a part of, uh, you know, they're kind of coming along on the board as well how God is training different people. And, you know, we see people uh, have to pass the baton to some of you younger people. And some of you are stepping up and doing jobs in the church, like the backpack ministry and different things. That was formerly done by other people. Thank you. Thank you. How important it is. And some of us, you know, we have to let go. We have to, you know, sometimes you have to pry the baton out of our hand. <laughs> but sometimes we need to let go allow someone else to do the job for us because we don't want to rob someone else of the blessing that God has for them. I want to ask the musicians to come as we pray. Dear Father, we're thankful today to be in a place where we know, God, that you have called us to serve and we're willing to do that. We're willing to pitch in, Lord, and I don't think that there's any of us here that feels like any job is too low for us. God, you gave us an example as a servant who became the servant of men and women. Now, Lord, I pray you'd allow us to do that as well. God, make us like you. Make us like you. You are a servant. Make us one too. Lord, I am willing. Do what you must do to make me like you, Lord. Make me like you. Amen.